Welcome to Health Hackers episode 40. I am feeling very privileged to be joined by IVF royalty today, Professor Simon <laughs> Fischel, the multi-award winning international scientist and fertility treatment specialist. Simon was part of the original pioneering team at the world's first in vitro fertilization clinic. Since then, he's dedicated his career to helping people to have children. He founded Care Fertility, a network of IVF centers in the UK, and those clinics have led to the births of more than 30,000 babies. Additionally, Simon has published over 200 clinical papers and edited four books. He's also the CEO of ProFam, a company that recently hit the headlines after launching a medical procedure that could delay the menopause by 20 years. And it is this that I really want to talk about first. Simon, thank you for joining me. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. A bit of a, a humbling kind of interview, introduction, but thank you. You're very modest. Now, tell me what happens in this operation, this pioneering procedure to delay the menopause, and why would a woman want to undergo it? Well, the first question is a bit easier than the second one. The second one is a very big question. The first one, uh, what happens is that uh, a part, about one third to one half, of the outer layer of one ovary only is removed in a keyhole surgery procedure. And that takes about 30 minutes and it needs uh, a really gifted laparoscopic microsurgeon to do it. And once that tissue is removed, then the real business starts because it's taken to a highly specialized laboratory with uh, very skilled practitioners. I'm not sure what we call them with a kind of tissue, tissue cryobiologists who prepare that tissue and divide it up into very thin strips, millimeter strips, something like four by eight millimeter strips. Those strips are then bathed in nutrients and an antifreeze, what we call a, a cryoprotectant. And that's because we have to take the temperature of that tissue down to minus 150 degrees centigrade. The tissue is then stored at that or lower temperature and where it can remain well, almost indefinitely, but certainly for very many decades without any biological deterioration. And that process takes about four hours. So it's 30 minutes to remove the tissue, about four hours to prepare it. That gives the holder of that tissue, if you like, the woman whose, whose tissue it comes from, the double opportunity potentially of preserving fertility because in that tissue, are hundreds, maybe thousands of eggs. But because those eggs are there, the hormones are being preserved that keeps a woman's cycle going. In other words, her premenstrual phase going. So what we're actually doing is also preserving her hormones. It's a hormonal preservation, which could be used to delay the menopause. And so what is so wrong with the menopause that a woman would want to undergo this procedure to delay it? Well, there's nothing wrong with the menopause. So it's, it, it happens to every single woman on the planet if she lives long enough. But unfortunately, there are several things in play right now in terms of human evolution. So probably 150 years ago, women wouldn't live much after the fertile period, maybe 10, 15 years most women would have died following that fertile period, beginning of the menopause. Today, women are living probably as long in the menopause, or maybe even longer in the menopause than ever in their history. Now, for 25% of women, they have no symptoms going through the menopause. And what the menopause actually is, is a massive reduction in their cycling hormones, particularly estrogen. They go into a very low, estrogenic state, which for some women causes issues. I think they're all pretty severe issues, so we won't really say mild to severe because a woman experiencing mood swings, hot flushes, anxiety, it's still pretty severe. But you can move up the scale where many women suffer things like osteoporosis to a very severe extent, risks of cardiovascular disease, and cognitive dysfunction. And, and they are quite significant if they're going to be protracted. 
And that's one of the issues here. So for 75% of women, they need some clinical support. If you look at all the industrial nations who would uh, support healthcare, the menopause bill, the treatment of menopause in one form or another for millions of women is huge because a large number of women require some sort of help and, and support. Now, if you're getting into the very severe phases, if you're actually carrying that for very many years, decades, it's probably not as great as if it was going to be for a shorter period of your life. But this is the conversation mm. we need to have. Up until now, up until your procedure, uh, a mature woman would be able to try and manage symptoms of the menopause with hormone replacement therapy. So putting back some of those hormones that are being lost with age. What are the problems in your eyes with going down the HRT route only? Well, I don't think there are any problems with HRT. It's been, it's been around a while. It's been modified. There have been issues with HRT. Some of them, the more recently, have been utterly overblown, where uh, there's been a real concern about an increase in, in breast cancer. But actually, most scientists now believe that that is, was well overblown, but it's frightened a lot of people off from using HRT. Also, HRT itself is not good for everybody. And that's, that's the other thing that people are not getting in this conversation, is that not one glove fits all in any medical procedure. There are many women that are happy with HRT, and that's fine. The other thing we should recognize is that HRT is a, it's a rather blunt instrument compared to the natural biology. It's a pharma, pharmacologically produced agent, even though they're virtually identical to the estrogen and progesterone that the body produces. But it's delivered in a way that's not physiological. When our organs produce our hormones, they do so in an interconnected, exquisitely orchestrated way. They're, they're produced in, in pulsatile fashion. They're produced in certain rhythms that help control the function of our cells and our tissues in the body. And it may well be that actually the production of those hormones utterly naturally, because it's coming from your own tissue, is a far better health gain than using a, a pharmacological HRT um, drug. But for many it won't be, but for some it might be far better. So my understanding is that ovarian tissue freezing is already carried out in women who are about to undergo cancer treatment so they can try and conceive in the future. But with this new procedure for healthy women, what are the risks of removing ovarian tissue? Well, you, you've hit the nail on the head in a very important point. We are not doing something fantastically new. What we're doing is joining the dots of what's been happening for 20 years in women with cancer and severe disease who are going to lose their fertility. A very a worthy the freezing eggs was not possible. Ovarian tissue is being taken and it's been stored and it's been transplanted back. There have been about 5,000 cases now that have been published over the years of ovarian tissue being removed. In the women where the tissue has been transplanted black for fertility purposes, about 30 or 40 percent of them have been successful in having babies, and half of those by IVF and half of those naturally. So there's two things we know from that. One is in 95 percent of patients who've had the tissue back, the hormones kick in and the eggs start being produced. So fertility can be resumed. But it's the fact that the hormones kick in. We know that that tissue can produce the hormones that a woman needs. So all we've done is then said, right, why not extend this opportunity from women who've needed this for health reasons to young, healthy women because of the way society is at the moment in terms of uh, being uncertain about one's fertility future and also about the menopause living so much longer and provide natural HRT to women as well as storing a fertility option for them all in one go but it's offering it to young, healthy women. So that, that's the sort of leap that we've made with this new technology. Now, the challenge will be, to some extent, um, we now know from the vast amount of inquiries to our website that women who are later 30s are very keen on this. But the challenge will be, would younger women 
want to do this? Would parents of younger women want to support them? Because that's where the real power is here. I mean, to put it crudely, is how much fuel is in the tank. We know that as a woman approaches the end of her 30s into her 40s, the egg pool, which is the source of everything, is declining rapidly. And it's when the egg pool dies out, she hits the menopause. That egg pool is strong and voluminous in, in the early 20s and late 20s, for example. And that's where all the power is, where lots of eggs are and where all the hormones are. And the challenge is, will young, healthy women want to do this? What's your instinct over whether young, healthy women will want to? Well, I think it will be part of the conversation. So, for example, I had a, a very interesting chat with a, an American um, journalist just recently who was really quite sceptical at the beginning and was quite well, bowled over, I would say, at the end of the conversation. And she said she's wearing an estrogen patch herself. She's 60-odd years of age. She's never been happy with it. And she's had lots of issues, blah, blah. She's sending her three daughters. <laughs> She's had the conversation with her three daughters. They range from, I think, late 20s to early 30s, and she wants them to do it. Um, I, and some people feel a bit horrified, by that, I suppose, but I've had this conversation with my youngest daughter. Um, see, there are other things that are happening which are important. So my eldest daughter, for example, she's struggling with secondary infertility. And this is on the rise in society. This is a big issue. And a lot of women move on to egg donation because of the problems of, of the fertility in, in later life and trying to have a baby then. Well, if they've got their own egg stored, that could be used. If there's enough tissue there, it could also be used for hormonal preservation later. So there is a potential double benefit. Some would say the, um, the real experiment here is not so much the ovarian tissue and whether it works. We know that works. The experiment here is whether it's going to be beneficial for um, young for, well, for women who have this later in, in life. Um, and I, I have to say, the answer is we, don't, we won't know. If it's a young woman today of 30 who has her tissue frozen, uh, we won't really know for maybe 30 years as to whether the benefit is really happening to thousands of thousands of women. But we believe it could be. Now, if we don't start this, and this was my point when we brought the ProFam founders together. If we don't start this now, there'll be another genera generation of women that can't have at least the conversation, can't potentially consider the opportunity. And maybe it will never be there if we always keep delaying it. It's, it's an interesting but difficult conversation to have. Is there a danger that uh, given everything you've just said there, that some women might begin to put a bit too much trust in medical interventions when it comes to fertility. And as a result, they just keep on delaying having babies. And then what if the experiment doesn't work out for them and they can't conceive later on? Um, they left it too late. Do you think there's, there's a danger that we could become over-reliant on this idea that a medical intervention could prolong our fertility? Well, there's always a risk of that. It's a very sensible question. But what's the alternative when it's already happening? We've got massive declining birth rates across industrialized nations. Now, some people may think, well, that's what planet Earth needs. But it's not what the individual needs, and it's actually what not what nations need, because you need a replacement population to keep that nation healthy and to, to keep it economically viable. So it's already happening. So we can't say that, you know, women, women are going through IVF. Are they relying that IVF may help them in the future? It's not right for all women going through, through IVF to have IVF. It doesn't work for them all, but it's the only option they've got. The same with almost many medical procedures. It's just that this is reality, and yes, you could be glib and take the view, well, women, just get out there and have your babies young. I mean, that's just not, it's just not on. It's just not going to happen in, in the modern climate. Um, and we have to be realistic. And therefore, we have to try to have strategies that help people plan for their lives. The other way of looking at this, of course, is if you're going to think about taking HRT in the future, which maybe 60% of women do, this is natural HRT. 
So that's another, another way of looking at it. It's not just postponing the menopause, it's natural HRT. I want to talk about um, infertility and IVF in a moment, but just going back to um, the, the actual operation itself and, and who it can be effective for. Um, a lot of women uh, of my age in their thirties uh, suffer with hormonal imbalances. So uh, say for example, a woman has uh, menstrual cycle irregularities or even temporarily no periods at all. And it could be because of lifestyle factors, stress, weight loss, or, some women might come off the contraceptive pill and have that post pill amenorrhea stage. So do those kinds of hormonal irregularities cause that woman's ovary tissue to suffer at all? So it's a very broad question and it really depends on the particular condition. Uh, quite often, no, sometimes yes. So for example, we now know that 1% of young women, and I mean young women, enter what's called a premature menopause, very early menopause, well before they're 40. Now, when you look at just the UK, that 1% relates to 1 million women between the age of 25 and 40 who will enter the premature menopause. Now, if they have preserved their tissue early, and they don't even know they're going to enter the premature menopause. That could be certainly beneficial for them, especially for the fertility angle. In terms of other hormonal irregularities, um, the issue here is going to be clearly being, first of all, checked out by a specialist. And then if there is any hint that those irregularities could put a woman into early menopause a few years down the line, again, Preserving the ovarian tissue is probably her best option. A lot of women now are trying to consider egg freezing, but I believe that ovarian tissue freezing will overtake egg freezing eventually. Um, I, I'm not going to take you down a, a, a different route, but egg freezing has its problems. It's not as efficient as people think. And so, again, if there's real concern about one's fertility being curtailed, in, in the 30s because of hormonal irregularities, and that needs to be checked out, it can be. We can do studies called ovarian reserve tests. These are tests using blood, uh, blood tests and ultrasound scan that can tell us um, roughly the kind of egg pool that's still residing in the ovary. If that is looking to be depleting much quicker than her biological age would suggest, it may well be a great benefit for her to have some ovarian tissue frozen. The other thing I should mention when you asked about risk earlier, by removing a part of an ovary, we even know by removing a whole ovary, you are not reducing a woman's chance of fertility. You are not reducing her time to menopause. So she's not going to enter menopause early if she's of normal health and a whole ovary is removed. So we only remove a part of one ovary and she's not going to have fertility. We know this from many, many years of studies of patients, for example, with disease and cancer. Their fertility health and the uh, menopausal age is not affected. So a lot of women in their 30s right now who might be watching this say that they have um, very stressful lives and um, I know that every individual would need to be assessed for their own circumstances. But would this procedure still work for a woman who, um, say she's got a very stressful life and her periods have stopped for a year. She's not, it's not early menopause, or maybe she over-exercised or, or lost a lot of weight. If she went under the knife, had the operation, surely the ovarian tissue that's being extracted and frozen would be coming from an ovary that wasn't producing optimal estrogen or progesterone at the time that it was extracted. So therefore, would those women probably not be able to have this procedure because the tissue that gets implanted back into them in years to come didn't come from an optimal stage in their hormonal life? Right, so the question here is whether the ovary still has a big egg pool, irrespective of whether the woman is ovulating or having periods. And as I mentioned before, the body is exquisitely tuned. There's a magnificent orchestration of hormones. Actually, the axis is really a couple of glands in the brain, 
the ovaries, the womb, they're all interlinked and with other organs like the adrenals, etc. Now, stress plays a fantastically uh, difficult um, function on the body in, in many ways. And there's different types of stress. You can be emotionally stressed, but not physiologically stressed. You can be emotionally relaxed, but don't realize you're physiologically stressed. And that upsets your hormones. It doesn't mean that the ovary still isn't packed with eggs. It's just that the balance of hormones has simply stopped ovulation happening, periods happening. And we know they, that they can be resolved. Eventually they, they can resume. So actually by taking tissue that's still packed with eggs, it will function. It just needs to be in the right environment to function. So I think those women, they, they, they wouldn't be at risk at all of having something that was inferior, if you like. So it's about the egg pool, not how regular your menstruation is. Yes, you can have a very strong egg pool, but your own lifestyle could affect how your uh, of your. So you, you must remember that when I talk about the egg pool, they are what we call, if you like, primitive. We call them primordial follicles, a tiny little, tiny little sac, hardly a sac, that contains the eggs. Now, those are the kind of eggs you were born with. A woman is born with all the eggs she's ever going to possess. She doesn't make eggs. They just deteriorate over the many years that she's had that pool. When they become mature eggs, it's only the once a month when a few of them start to mature, the sac grows and that starts to get to the place where it might ovulate and that egg starts to ripen. They're not the eggs we're dealing with. We're dealing with those almost stem cell-like eggs, if you like. They're very, very tiny beginnings of what's going to make a mature egg. So if the ovary's packed with them, she's packing a big punch. She's still got a lot of power to go for many years. Now let's talk about your epic work in IVF. You were part of the original team at the world's first IVF clinic that opened in Cambridgeshire in 1980. Um, looking back to those years, at the very start, what was the reaction like from society at the time about what you were doing? Uh, from horror to abject rejection of the principle and the practice. It was unbelievable how few people were supportive. And again, it takes, it actually is a mirror image to some extent of what we're doing now with Profan, with our very tissue freezing. Um, we had, um, some eminent people and some very eminent people. Now, we had Nobel Prize winners like James Watson of the Watson and Crick DNA fame saying this should not be allowed to happen. He was at an American Congress hearing, said he would be absolutely against it. It, it, it wouldn't work. And we had people at the time, uh, Dr. Robert Winston, who, who is now known as Lord Winston, um, Something he's a fertility pioneer, but actually at the time he was utterly against this work. He was very vociferous in saying that uh, we shouldn't allow IVF to happen. And so we were really up against it. There was, um, well, in fact, the head of my own department, the physiology department in Cambridge, advised me not to, to, to work with Bob Edwards uh, at the first clinic, saying that I will ruin my, my future and that actually it's the work of the devil. And it, it was, we were really up against it. Um, um, we published a scientific paper in 1984 where it resulted in Bob Edwards and I having a writ for murder against us because we had human embryos growing in a dish which didn't survive. And it, it, was, it was an amazingly difficult time, but the real pioneers, they were the patients. Because what did they have to go on? They had society against them and a few of us who believed we could help. The other thing that's changed dramatically as time crept on was we just didn't, there was so much we didn't know. There was so much we didn't understand. If you looked at our IVF lab then, it, it really, I mean, even having it in a museum, you'd laugh compared to an IVF laboratory today, the way technology's moved on. We didn't know we hardly knew male infertility existed at all. We were utterly gobsmacked when we put sperm and eggs together and were from a man who had a fantastic sperm count and the sperm swimming at 100 miles an hour to see that those sperm couldn't fertilize an egg. 
which is why I went on to develop the sperm microinjection technology, because we just kept learning as we were going along. It was, it was a hard time, but it was a fascinating time. And now you are the professor who's responsible for more than 30,000 babies. Uh, how, how does that feel? Um, unbelievably humbling. And I know we use the word humbling quite glib, actually, but it just is. I mean, and if you think about it, if we listen to, to Winston or, or, or um, James Watson back in those days, there would be 14 million parents today who would not be parents. And there wouldn't be grandparents. And there wouldn't be those children alive today. So in the end, sometimes, and I know people... People think it's very, very hard, but you, you just got to be bold and brave at times. And even when patients come along the pioneering journey, it's not easy on them because many patients missed out at the time. So it, it, it is tough, especially in a world we live in today where evidence-based medicine is important. And of course, who wouldn't agree you need to have evidence to be able to offer something? But how do you gain that evidence in the first place? So, you know, I would say that... that um, I've been very fortunate, extremely lucky to have been involved in a, a career that, well, what is better than being able to produce a human child, for somebody who wants one, somebody who's going to bring it up, love them, and hopefully one day they will produce generations of, of, of their own. So I, I, I've been blessed to be in this, in this career. If you could speak to every couple in the world um, who are struggling to conceive, um, and they might be considering IVF, what would you want them to know and to really understand before they go into IVF? Well, first I have to say that we don't have all the answers because we don't know all the questions. So all the time we're trying to help people who flummox us at times, who confuse us because we think it would be so easy to help them conceive and, and they can't. But in terms of their own individual circumstance, the first most important point for anybody to understand, and this needs to be to young people before they're couples, a young woman, a young man, particularly a woman, age matters. The most single difficult barrier for conception is the age of the woman, because as she ages, and she could be biologically um, aging, but, but still a very young woman. You know, when you think of a 45-year-old woman today, well, she's a young mm. snippet of a girl, really, who are sitting where I'm sitting from. But her ovaries still think they are the way they were 500 years ago in human evolution. They're packing in. And it's, it's age. So the quality of the eggs in those ovaries also decline from about 35 onwards, precipitately. So it's very important that they know that age is the first primary fact. The second thing is if they're struggling, then they need to seek advice. Now, if they seek the right professional advice, they should not be shunted through the most expensive procedures early on. They will get advice to tell them where it starts to become important. They go down route A, route B, or route C. The older they are, route C, I say IVF, might be better sooner rather than later because one of the things IVF can be is diagnostic. And one of the great problems couples have is they go through a, an earlier roundabout system, let's call it maybe the National Health Service in some areas that are maybe not so clued up. And it takes two or three or four years for them to find out that actually they've not got much further down the road. And that three or four more years can be the big issue because now the woman, the original problem is less of an issue than she's now three or four years older. So very simply put, uh, based on your age, seek advice early on. Make sure you seek advice from a profession who will be honest and open about your opportunity. You, don't, you may not need IVF straight away, but you need to understand it's there. And until, according to your personal circumstances, we need to put you on the right road. And if we need to fast track you because of certain things, well, then that needs to happen. What is the biggest reason for infertility among the couples that you see? Is it age? Well, it really varies now. So there are uh, plenty of people who just have a severe infertility problem. So the woman is hardly producing eggs, the man is hardly producing sperm. 
doesn't matter what age they are, that's going to be a big problem. There are uh, women who uh, are coming with a man who does have a, a what we call a subfertile problem. So he doesn't think he's got a problem because he's got a, a sperm count that seems to be okay. But actually, it wasn't until you put the sperm and eggs together in a dish that you find out the sperm does have a problem. But they haven't done that uh, IVF route for several years of investigations first. And so now it's the woman's age is the problem. And so her eggs are what we call chromosomally compromised. The DNA, the, the, the uh, genetic information there is, is compromised. We see a, a really whole range. And it depends whether they're coming later or they're coming earlier. If they're coming earlier, that's generally because there is, there is a real fertility issue that we can identify. Sometimes I call it an inefficiency issue. So you have a little bit of uh, maybe a problem with the woman. She, she might not be ovulating regularly, but she doesn't realize that because she's having periods regularly. And when she's ovulating, she actually isn't releasing a quality egg to be fertilized. But at the same time, a man has a slightly lower sperm count. Combined, if you think you've only got 12 ovulations in a year, if only half of them are quality, but they're being compromised because of the man's sperm, and then it may well be that, well, they're not together for every ovulation because they're busy and they're working. It's an efficiency issue rather than a pure infertility issue. So there's all that one has to bear in mind. And that's why sometimes you find women can't, can't conceive with their partner. They go through IVF, they have a baby, and bingo, straight away, they have another baby naturally. Is infertility rising? And, and if it is, do you have any theories as to why? It is on the increase, I, 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 for different reasons. So yes, there's the women having babies later issue, and that's why secondary infertility is on the increase, and not, much pe not many people talk about that. So I extended the charity that I established many decades ago called the Rachel Foundation to now actually include secondary infertility as well, because that also needs to be recognized. Um, infertility is different in different parts of the world um, because you have different environmental circumstances. But I, I think lifestyle, and for me, my hobby horse, is I think the toxicity and pollution in our world is increasing infertility. That is, for me, a very big problem. We need to get to grips with our polluted, toxic world. And I don't know how we do that, but that is causing um, fertility issues, both in men and in women. There is certainly a decrease in sperm count in men, certainly in advanced countries. Um, in most countries where men have been tested, increasing other testicular problems too. So it's not just about women, it's certainly about, about men as well. Um, and the later we both, men and women, leave um, the opportunity to try to have children, which is not their fault, it's society's issue as well, then it, it is going to com complicate any inefficiency there with, with the age. So there are many reasons why infertility is on the increase. On the toxicity note, do you just mean pollution or do you mean the kind of chemical products we put on our skin every day? Are they all under that umbrella? Yes, plus the air particles. You know, the the uh, particles that we breathe in from our polluted atmosphere be it from, well, my real pet hobby horse is diesel fumes. You know, big cities with polluting taxis and, 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 other, and other cars. And, and when you're in environments that are pretty closed, um, where they're releasing diesel fumes, you're getting a big, bigger dose of it. And then there are people who may smoke on top of that, which are taking in hundreds, if not thousands of toxins every time they smoke. Um, so... And actually, and that one, I'm not sure in terms of fertility effects, but there's absolutely no doubt these, these micro and nanoplastic particles that we're all taking on board by lots of groups is potentially going to cause a problem, probably more to our general health than our fertility. But again, if it's affecting our tissues, which exquisitely affect our hormones, which then affect the production of sperm, the production of eggs, etc., it could all be interlinked. So I think... It, um, the food we take on board. Uh, if you now look at farmers' fields where they have to leave an area next to where the crop is growing for uh, wildlife activity, you see the amount of growth there is phenomenal. And yet you look where the crops are, there's nothing at all except the crops. What's keeping that down? 
It's, it, it's all these things we really need to consider. Uh, not enough is done, I think, to, to look at how polluted our individual bodies are. Yeah, it's a really interesting topic and one that actually does fascinate me. I'm fascinated by that. And it's, it's good to hear you talk about that because it's something that I don't often hear too much about in terms of how it could affect our fertility. Um, I know that I've kept you over time already. So my final question is, um, given that you've seen so many advances in IVF technology over your years, what is it that you're looking forward to the most in the future? What's exciting you most in terms of IVF technology or, or perhaps maybe it's work at Profam and the um, ovarian tissue operation, which is exciting you most? Well, I'm glad you're not asking me in general terms like um, AI and cyborgs and stuff like that. But um, in terms of well, IVF, what I'm really looking forward to is becoming more consistent, more successful, uh, more reproducible. Um, we have to accept that humans are they're not infallible. And that makes doctors, scientists, everybody fallible to some extent. We need to be able to reach the highest level we possibly can and minimize inconsistency, variability. So I'm looking forward to the introduction of more and more technologies. And we're doing that, for example, in our IVF lab. We're using more and more machine learning. I prefer that to AI, but we're using more and more machine learning to tell us which is the embryo that's more likely to make a baby, which is going to enhance our success rates even more. It, it, it is doing. We have a technology called Care Maps, for example, that we use in the Care Fertility Group, and we've been developing this over 10 years, and it's clearly improving our success rates, and it's telling the embryologist, not the other way around, which is the best embryo. More and more of this is going to come into our practice because our brains cannot hold the information that we need to be analytical enough to decide what's best for an individual woman, man, or that embryo. And I think Profam is going to be an interesting, interesting time. I, I, I regret a little bit that the real outcome of Profam, I probably won't be around to see. You know, if my, if my youngest daughter in her mid twenties wants to freeze her ovarian tissue, and then she wants to say to me, dad, Actually, I'm glad you, you did this because the natural HRT I've got is just making me feel fantastic. She's going to be 35 years older when she would tell me that. Where am I going to be in 35 years' time? <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 am, I am hoping we continue to push the boundaries because the world is changing, lifestyles are changing, humanity is changing. We've just got to be human about how we measure, how we manage the um, human conditions of the future. Because life is not what it was 50 years ago. It's what it's going to be in the next 50 years. Simon, it's been so fascinating talking to you. Um, if people are watching this right now and they want to follow your work or hear more about you, uh, what's your Twitter handle and website? Um, right, well, I'm very bad on social media and I'm very bad on Twitter, but we have a Profam at Facebook. We have a, I have a Twitter account, which I think, oh, it's really bad, but it's, I think it's uh, Simon official underscore IVF, but I don't know. Uh, I think you're <laughs> right. Yeah, I've got, I've actually got it uh, written down here somewhere. Yeah, at Simon official underscore IVF. And, okay, yep. And Profam, P-R-O-F-A-M. Yeah, www.profam.co.uk is our website if you want more information on Profam. And Care Fertility is www.carefertilityoneword.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much. YouTube viewers, I really appreciate you watching that video. It would be wonderful if you hit the red subscribe button. It costs you nothing and it means that you'll get notified whenever I post a Health Hackers video. You can follow me on social media too, handles right beneath me. I love hearing from you. Bye-bye.